Well, good morning. By this stage in my life as a preacher, when I enter a pulpit, there are very few firsts. But there is one today. I have never before encountered a pulpit in which a copy of the New Testament in both Greek and Latin is on the pulpit itself. And as a matter of fact, it was around the Greek New Testament that Scott Colglazier and I met the first time. It was 1983. I doubt if a single member of the choir was even born in 1983. And Scott and I both had brown hair. In the hairstyle of the day, I would graciously describe it as designed like the head of a floor mop just hanging <clears throat> over your eyes. He came to us uh, from southern Indiana. And I have never actually been to the Cole Glacier homestead, but I picture it like this. A cabin set back in a meadow, smoke rising from the chimney, cows standing in the yard. In back, a little building suitable for occupant see by only one person at a time, and in the woods just beyond, a moonshine still steaming. <laughs> Scott did come to us uh, from southern Indiana, but he really came at an advanced state of being. I have to say, it was my second year of teaching, it was 1983, and there was not much gap in age between Scott and me. But to that time, nor since, have I encountered even a handful of students who came with his preparation, his intensity, his love of life, his depth of poetry, and his passion for God, the human being, and justice. And I have to pay him one of the highest compliments that a teacher can pay a student which is to say that he has become my teacher. And thinking about those days, student, teacher, and around the Greek New Testament, brings out the teacher in me, which prompts me to ask you to take out a pencil and a piece of paper, or an electronic device suitable for, for preparing an electronic document that you can email me for a pop quiz. That's what teachers do, give quizzes, yes? So the first question is, what is the Holy Spirit? And the second question is, what does the Holy Spirit do? Now this is a little embarrassing but I have to tell you that in the church in which I grew up, and we should compare notes on this after the service because it was a congregation of the Christian church, Disciples of Christ, the only time I can really remember the Holy Spirit being discussed in the assembly was, well, it wasn't actually discussed. It was only mentioned at the time of baptism when the minister raised his, and it was his, hand over the candidate for baptism and said, I immerse you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We just didn't talk about the Spirit. Now we knew other churches did because in those days we had evening services. And our evening service in the old building downtown was in the water-cooled, air-conditioned comfort of the first AC in a congregation in our little community. But when our evening service ended about eight o'clock, my friends and I would pile in Johnny's 1957 Chevrolet and we would drive down the gravel street by one of the Pentecostal churches which did not have air conditioning and whose windows were open and into which we could see a band, a guitar, a tambourine. We could see people dancing, not in the model of liturgical dance, but in the spontaneity of what they call the spirit, 
and we saw people slain in the Spirit become rigid as a board and fall straight down. If that was the Holy Spirit, we did not want to get too close to it. So it was quite a surprise to me when I got to university and began to read the Greek New Testament and discover that the Spirit occurs all over its pages. The Greek word for spirit is pneuma, as in our word pneumonia or pneumatic, and it refers in the broad sense to wind or to breath. And in the Bible, it refers to an entity called the Holy Spirit, God's closest agent, who works in God's behalf a field of force or energy or power. God working through the Spirit, an agent in the world, to make things happen in the same way that you can take a balloon limp and flat and fill it with air and it becomes alive. And that's what the Spirit does in the Bible as a whole, but particularly in the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts, written by the same person. And in this material, when we ask the question, how can you tell when the Spirit is moving, Luke gives two dimensions to an answer. The first is that the Spirit fills or empowers as a wind. Jack read just a moment ago, it came from heaven like the rush of a mighty wind and filled the house where they were sitting and divided tongues came down as if from these chandeliers and rested on each one of them and filled them with fire. Why this emphasis on filling? I think it is because they needed something more. Jesus had called them and commissioned them to proclaim the coming of the realm of God, the unfolding within history of a new age of love, life, joy, peace, and abundance. But they were up against the Roman Empire, its idolatrous Caesar, its highly structured, stratified society in which people were locked into where they were born. And the Pax Romana, the famous peace of Rome, was enforced by a Roman soldier on every corner of every village, hamlet, town, city, and seaport. They needed something more. And not only that, but Jesus had just ascended to heaven and they were wondering what they would do next. Where would they get the strength to do what Jesus had asked them to do? You've been there, haven't you? That project you gave yourself to just didn't happen. That job you always wanted for which you had trained and prepared and gone into debt just never came about. That person you wanted to marry just married someone else. I had a poignant conversation with a student a few days ago at that point in life where she said, I think back over what I've done and that's all she could do. I think back over what I've done and what does it amount to? What a terrible way to get to an intersection of your life. But according to the book of Acts, God gives the spirit the sense of power, a sense of passion, even a sense of fire to fill and send. 
and I know it happens. I had another student whose life had literally fallen apart. She wondered whether she would be able to pick up the pieces enough to finish one semester. Then we were talking about the experience of drinking from the cup and eating the bread at the Lord's table. And she said, I had this moment where I just felt something more. And I knew I could make it. But how can you tell? How can you tell when that something more that you feel in life is the work of the Spirit? If you have that feeling, that sense of passion and drive, how can you tell when you're in the sphere of the Spirit and not just experiencing a hangover from too many anchovies on your pizza from the night before? That brings us to the second dimension of the work of the Spirit as it unfolds in Luke and Acts. The Spirit brings people together in communities of dignity, freedom, mutual recognition, and mutual support. If we had a map here, and we could trace the countries that Jack read a moment ago, we would see that they unfold systematically from east to west. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Cappadocia, and I give you an A for getting every one of those names pronounced correctly. From east to west, bringing people together from different backgrounds, different languages, different cultures, in the face of the Roman occupation, creating a community of mutual support, dignity, love, and transformation. Sound familiar? The longing for such a community in our own time, to be honest, once in a while when I'm out in the car and it comes to the top of the hour, I turn NPR off so I won't have to have my heart clench with one more round of news. That surly 15-year-old passes through the room. Where do you want to go? Grunt. What would you like to do? Scratch. When will you be back? Whenever the door closes. Even in church. Even in church. I've been to some meetings where the leaders essentially regarded one another as targets for target practice. And just these last few days, just these last few days, Baton Rouge, Dallas, Nice, Turkey, just this morning, Baton Rouge, again. My life from 1949 to the present is the story of one polarization of the human community after another. We need something more to draw us together. And the way the book of Acts pictures it, on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit comes down and makes it possible for people to understand one another and to live together in mutual recognition and support. The Spirit does not take away their differences. It makes their differences categories for enrichment. Oh, I've been trying for almost 40 years to get my wife, Linda, to be more like me. 
and I can't understand why she doesn't see the benefits of being more like me. But the truth is, and I wager you find this in relationships that you have too, the truth is that her difference in a context of respect makes me more than I would be otherwise, and I give thanks for it. How do you know? How do you know when the spirit is at work in a context, a situation, a relationship, when it is drawing people together in communities of respect and support. A couple of years ago, our Disciples News Network carried the news that Joseph M. Smith had died at the age of 99. For 20 years, Joe and I were members of the same congregation in Indianapolis, and he was from Georgia, not an ounce of fat, more than six feet tall, hair white, swept back. He had that dignified way of a southern gentleman, and when he spoke, there was no doubt he was from Georgia. He and his wife, Winifred, had trained as missionaries of our church, and they were on a boat for China in November of 1941 when their ship was diverted by the State Department to the Philippines where they could have safe harbor. Uh, within a few weeks, they were interned behind barbed wire where they stayed for three and a half years. Limited food, sleeping on bare wood, rain pouring through the porous roof, in the sun almost uncovered for hours, all under the direction of a commandant with minimum feeling and maximum imagination for human deprivation. When one of our daughters was age 16, she had an assignment to write a paper for school based on an interview with a person you admire. And so she went to Joe and Wen's house, two people she very much admired, and toward the end of the interview, she was so overwhelmed by the description of those three and a half years that she asked Joe eyeball to eyeball, how did you make it? How did you survive under those conditions? And he said, it was the spirit. There were times when you were when we were gathered behind the barbed wire for prayer, for Bible study, for worship with the loaf and the cup, there were times when we could just feel something more drawing us together. But the story did not stop there. This group of internees had a reunion some 25 years later, and the planning committee agreed that the first person they should invite was that commandant. And when he came, they forgave and embraced and wept together. I want to live a life like that. I want to be part of a congregation like that. I want to be part of a world like that.